very panel. And if you, in case you're wondering, the panel is right here, located in the middle of the boat. And I'm going to introduce the moderator, and we are so happy you're here. Please keep the conversation to a minimum. Uh, there'll be plenty of time to talk later on in the day during the cocktail party. So uh, we can have everybody's undivided attention here in the middle of the boat for the rest of the panel. This is Peter Villane, who's going to be our moderator today from <laughs> HDR. And welcome. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Actually, it's Pierre, but that's fine. It's the same thing. No problem. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome, everybody, to uh, our panel. Uh, regional ferry service with a, a subtext or subtitle, uh, how will we move towards a regional water transit authority? So we have a, a, a really great panel here. I've personally been involved in uh, quite a few uh, ferry uh, studies over the years, and uh, I could not have imagined a, a better panel to discuss uh, this today. I think before we start anything, what I'll, I'll do is introduce all the, uh, the panelists and then we will, the format will be to um, have two of our guests from, uh, from the Bay Area talk about the experience that, uh, it, there with the Water Emergency Transportation Authority. And uh, they're going to uh, outline how things evolved in the Bay Area. We'll then open it up to uh, responses from the other panelists who will um, who will uh, discuss and, and, and uh, the, what the, the, the WIDA is experiences was and, and try to uh, see what we can uh, find might be the, the relevance to our region. So I'm going to go down alphabetically. Starting off, uh, we have Ian Austin from URS uh, based in San Francisco. Ian manages the URS Marine Services Group. He has spent 33 years as an engineering consultant providing planning, design, and analyses for coastal and asterian uh, projects. And he's been involved in water transit planning in San Francisco Bay Area since uh, 1997. He has a longstanding involvement with uh, Water Emergency Transportation Authority and is currently working on development of new ferry transit service to downtown San Francisco, Berkeley, and Martinez. Genevieve Clifton uh, is the manager of uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation's Office of Maritime Resources. In addition to supervising the day-to-day -day activities of the office, she oversees the iBoat New Jersey and National Boating Infrastructure Grant and Ferry Boat Discretionary Funding Program, which together have an annual budget of more than 10 million. She develops port and marine trade uh, planning and has expertise in waterway safety, security, and operation. Uh, Genevieve is dedicated to the balanced growth and development of New Jersey's port, maritime, and marine transportation infrastructure. Um, anybody who's done anything remotely related to ferries in the region uh, is, knows who Janet Cox is. Janet is the general manager for the Port Authority's ferry transportation program, and uh, where she oversees the implementation and expansion of private ferry service operations in conjunction with other government entities, local municipalities, and private ferry operators in New York Harbor. Janet has overseen the construction of the, the PA's award-winning permanent Battery Park City Ferry Terminal, and she's currently working with New Jersey Transit to complete the 123 million rehab of the historic Hoboken Ferry Terminal, where she is expect, which is expected to open later this spring. Janet has overseen uh, the Port Authority's contribution towards a number of capital infrastructure necessary for ferry service, including uh, 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 facilities in Edgewater, uh, Yonkers, uh, and uh, she recently uh, completed uh, the regional ferry stu uh, study for the Port Authority that provides a framework for future efforts to maintain and expand New York Harbor Ferry Service. Also from the Bay Area, we have uh, John Sandinsky, uh, who's the manager of planning and development for the San Francisco Bay Area Water Transportation Authority, WIDA, which we'll be hearing a lot about today. Uh, he's responsible for all aspects of the design, environmental clearing, and construction of that agency's ferry terminals uh, and related projects such as operating and maintenance facilities. He oversees the agency's fare policy and is actively involved in integrating the system into the regional transit smart card program. He works directly on matters relating to service planning and scheduling and uh, is now becoming an operator of ferry services formerly under the jurisdiction of two Bay Area cities. Um, we also have uh, Bill Wheeler from the MTA. He's uh, the MTA's Director of Special Project Development and Planning. 
Bill has overseen the MTA's long-range planning framework, the planning foundation for the MTA mega projects, which include Eastside Access, Second Avenue Subway, and he has spearheaded the MTA's Regional Strategic Review, which is the foundation for regional initiatives in the MPA's 20-year capital plan, uh, capital needs assessment. More recently, he's leading a comprehensive inner railroad capacity evaluation uh, of Penn Station and, his, and its surrounding regional rail network. He's trained in both urban planning and transportation engineering. And finally, Madeline Wills from New York City Economic Development Corporation. Madeline is the Executive Vice President of the Planning, Development, and Maritime Division of EDC. She is responsible for many of the city's area-wide revitalization plans throughout the five boroughs, um, and she's uh, been involved. She has successfully supervised the Willits Point rezoning and the 60-acre Hunters Point South rezoning. She oversees dozens of waterfront developments, uh, transportation, street, streetscapes, and park improvements in the five boroughs, including East River Waterfront uh, Project, West Harlem Piers, Homeport, Coney Island, Brooklyn and Staten Island Ports, and the Jamaica Intermodal Projects. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, in a few words, uh, our region's ferry system uh, has uh, several unique features, uh, with the notable exception of the Staten Island Ferry, it's privately run and self-sustaining. And private ferries provide service to about 30,000 passengers a day. Uh, in comparison, the Staten Island Ferry, publicly run, provides uh, service to about 70,000. Currently, there are uh, several agencies that are directly involved in very as various aspects of, uh, of ferry services, including funding for peer facilities. And today's panel will discuss whether um, there is a different institutional setup that might be beneficial for the, uh, the region's ferry service. So we'll hear from our two speakers from the Bay Area and uh, who will describe the experience of uh, the Water Emergency Transportation Authority and our panel will then move on to, to discuss this. Uh, thanks. I'll start off with uh, John. No. Ian, sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you, Pierre. Yes, I'm uh, Ian Austin uh, with Your in San Francisco. And I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about the creation of a regional water transit system in San Francisco uh, that took place uh, in the late 90s. Um, I was reflecting on the plane flying out here yesterday on a couple of personalities we had involved in the creation process. And um, they headed up the Blue Ribbon Task Force that was created in uh, 97 uh, that resulted in a, an action plan down here that uh, created WTA in, in 99. And I realize the, the two personalities involved were uh, very much symbolic of the challenges which uh, faced water transit then and continue to face water transit now, as uh, John will expand on. Now, the California Senate in 97 uh, created a uh, task force, Blue Ribbon Task Force, to study the very concept I think you're struggling with here, is water, trans uh, is water transit fe feasible, expanded water transit in the Bay Area, um, and what's going to take? And the driver behind this, pro there were basically five reasons why this task force was created. First, in the heady days of the late 90s, before the bubble, um, congestion in the Bay Area was predicted to expand by 249 percent, not 250, but 249 percent by 2020 if nothing was done. So we had a congestion driver. Secondly, um, ferries had proved their value in a couple of natural and man-made disasters, uh, notably the Loma Prieta earthquake in 89, which you may be aware of, which brought down uh, the highways and uh, the east span of the Bay Bridge. And an, an emergency ferry service had been very effective for a number of months in uh, restoring some, some transit. Third, the, the Bay was really perceived to be uh, an underutilized resource. Um, those of you who know the Bay Area may realize in the, in the 20s and 30s, um, ferry provided the way to get across the Bay uh, for cars, for, for trains, and for passengers. In uh, 1936, the, the transit peaked out of just under 50 million trips a year. And by the late 90s, it had dropped down to 5 million a year, so we're down to one-tenth of the capacity of the bay. So it was perceived as an un unutilized resource. Now, fourth point, why, why study? 
um, was infrastructure. Uh, at the time, the BART, our Bay Area Rapid Transit System, was expanding at about $70 million a mile. The, the highways were, were expanding at about $30 million a mile, and the perception was, we have water, it's here, the infrastructure's in place, we don't need to, to pay money. It's going to be cost effective, as John will tell you. It's very cost effective. So, and the fifth reason, which may be one of the more interesting ones, um, we have a Metropolitan uh, Transportation Commission in San Francisco area, which governs planning and funding for regional transit. Um, they actually focus on funding more than anything else. Um, and there was a perception that the MTC was not terribly enamored with water transit and had not done much to implement a plan that was developed in 92, 1992 to increase water transit. So these five reasons, um, well, the, and why was, why was MTC not interested? It's a perception I think you're struggling with. Someone mentioned while we we're talking downstairs. Um, ferry transit was perceived as small potatoes compared to the BART transit. Uh, BART carries, what is it, 300,000, 400,000 people a day across the bay. Uh, the bridges carry similar numbers. And even at, at 10 million trips a, a year on a ferry, it's still pretty small business. So the Blue Ribbon Task Force was created and um, to, to address basically three issues. I was, I was the manager of that process from the consultant side. Um, so the first question, is expanded ferry transit feasible? And if so, what's it going to look like? Secondly, what institutional structure should be put in place? And that's one of the questions you're struggling with here. And uh, third, and always the minor point, how is it going to be funded? Who's going to pay for it? So um, the California Senate, back to the personalities, uh, the California Senate appointed a very strong-willed developer uh, who had already created one ferry system in the Bay Area as the chair of the task force. And the Bay Area Council appointed a planner or a politician as his counterpoint, and, and I was the punching bag in between. So um, the chair was the visionary. He had, he was the build it, and it, literally, build it and they will come. That was his attitude, build it and they will come, damn their torpedoes, we're going to build a system that has you know, literally 120 ferries and 60 terminals, something like that. Um, well. After many sacrificial offerings to both parties, which were shredded and given back to me, we ended up with this action plan here, uh, which was adopted in 99 by the California Senate, and the first, actually the 29th transit agent agency in the Bay Area was created. So WIDA was the 29th agency. Why the 29th? That's one of the things you're struggling with. Um, so I'm going to put out some of the uh, points of how, wh why these, how we answer these questions, starting with the institutional question. And what we did is we looked at the, M at the MTC, which was the logical agency in the Bay Area for running uh, a ferry system. They were responsible for um, funding and planning. Um, they're the only regional agency in place. We have many, many other agencies, but they're all local. So the MTC was the first one to, to consider, but the, the perception was we wanted a, an agency that would develop and operate ferries. And MTC was not an operation er in, uh, entity. So uh, with many, many local agencies, the thinking was we need, truly need a regional agency that can, be, can develop a comprehensive system, integrate the six other ferry ser services that we have in place already, and um, basically make them match up better and increase ridership. And we really need something that was truly regional. We have nine Bay, nine Bay Area counties. Um, that consist will make up our region, and no one other than MTC was responsible for. So in '99, the California Senate did uh, pass, uh, did create the WTA, then the Water Transit Authority. John can speak to the cr the change in 2006 to focus more on emergency uh, transportation um, when the, when it was changed from the WTA to the WETA to emphasize emergency. But there was some emergency planned in the original. Um, mandate. So, so WTA's mandate is to implement and operate water transit in the San Francisco Bay Area. So funding. Um, one of the other, some of the other principles we uh, were told to implement was the new system could not compete, A, in terms of taking ridership from existing transit services. So it was not allowed to compete with BART, it was not allowed to compete with any of the bus services in the Bay Area. and 
it was not allowed to take any of their funds away. So we had to find a new source of funds. Well, we have these uh, state-owned bridges in the Bay Area, and at the time there was a consideration that uh, the bridge tolls were going to go up. They were very cheap. They were $2 or something like that back in the, uh, the mid-90s. Uh, and so by increasing the bridge toll by a dollar, there would be funds available, some of which would go to WTA. And that was the idea that, I think, it's, is it 24 million, John, you get from that? Something, there's, it, the, the one dollar increase on the bridge tolls is worth 115 million a year. And about that 24 million would go to fund the capital side of um, WIDA. And of course, the real challenge is the operating side. So um, back to the first question, what would the ferry system look like? Well, this is where our developer had a field day. And in this action plan that is down here on the table, if you want to look at it, in the pre-bubble days, the phase one critical mass was seen as what was necessary to take about four uh, lanes of traffic off one of the bridges. A again, something like 15 to 20 million riders a year. This system was going to have 28 terminals, it was going to have 75 new vessels, and it was going to be implemented in five to 10 years. So that was, uh, that was 99, here we are, what's this, uh, 13 years later. We've got two new vessels, we've got one new terminal coming on next year, and I think the challenge is still the same. Uh, you can have a great vision, you can plan something, but unless you can find operational monies to make it work, um, progress is going to be a lot slower than we planned back then. So there's some initial thoughts. John, would you like to take it from there? Thanks, Ian. One of the advantages of having Ian uh, working for me is he is the institutional memory of the Water Transit Authority. Literally all the original staff are gone. Um, so the people who did all the systems planning and understand what's behind all the numbers, millions of dollars worth of ridership uh, forecast and so forth are gone. So we rely on Ian to tell us what the real story is behind the WTA. So where are we at now? As Ian mentioned, um, we're in the process of building our first terminal. I've been with the Water Emergency or Water Transit Authority six and a half years. I was brought in thinking that in six months I was going to be building a ferry terminal. It took six and a half years to get to this point, um, major reasons being funding issues. Uh, most of our funding uh, for our capital program comes from the state through a, uh, a series of bonds that are being sold or were being sold by the state to finance water transit activities in San Francisco Bay. Unfortunately, the state is $16 billion in debt at this point in time, and they're having a very difficult time selling bonds. And indeed, for a while, they did sell our bonds, but we didn't see the money. It seems that the money might have been used for other purposes for a short period of time, and we finally had a legislator who was able to shake the tree and, and get the initial amounts of money available. So besides the capital funding issue, Ian touched on some of the other issues. The skepticism in the Bay Region towards water emergency or water transit. Uh, we carry less totally system-wide, all the transit, water transit systems, less than 1% of all the commuters in San Francisco Bay. Um, even a few million dollars a year that we are able to get through, through uh, through uh, sales tax money or through uh, regional fares um, is seen as critical money for other purposes. So um, there's always attempts to grab our money. And it's a very competitive market with 29 transit systems. Although right now, there's only 27 transit systems. We're the first agency in San Francisco Bay to take over existing transit services. When we were transformed from the Water Transit Authority to the Water Emergency Transportation Authority, the legislature um, was able to uh, adopt a vision that our uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization has had in its uh, uh, front sites for a long time to try to consolidate transit. A Federal Transit Administration official one time said, and this is a, a long time ago, so some of you may not get the illusion, that the Bay Area is the Beirut of public transit. Um, um, in any event, we are now, as, as of last Friday, or a week ago Friday, we are now formerly a transit operator. Unlike this, the uh, New York area, every water tra taxi service, every water transit service in the Bay Area, save one, is publicly subsidized. 
We have the highest fare box to operating cost ratio requirement in the state of California. We have to get 40% of our operating costs from the fare box. Um, no other transit system needs to do that, to do that. Um, and it's a testimony to why so, some people don't support ferry transit. They see it as cost ineffective. Um, when you look at the cost per passenger mile, at the operating cost, um, and some of the stuff that I've seen done here in New York, we start rivaling uh, at least express bus services, if not rail services. So one of the big issues has been the opposition uh, by local transit operators to our existence. Another, another real in the trenches issue we, we, we face is we're a separate agency. We're separate from any city, from the region. Every time we go to build a new ferry terminal, we have to partner with that particular uh, jurisdiction, be it a harbor district, be it a local city, and in essence, lease the property on which we are going to build our facility. Um, in one case, we ended up paying um, a multi-year lease of several millions of dollars, which was really a payment in to defer their, um, their payments to the State Department of Boating and Waterways for a failed attempt to rehab um, a part of a marina. In another case, uh, in the city of Berkeley, a long fight with, within the city about whether we would be leased that property for free or we would have to pay for it. In this era of diminished returns, a number of people within the city wanted us to have to pay rent for that land because they saw that as a way of helping to support the marina, which is an enterprise fund. It has to make all its revenue, uh, uh, pay all its costs from revenues. So they saw us as a cash cow. And because we have several million dollars in the bank, everyone sees us as a cash cow. Well, in that case, we were very fortunate that some of the citizens commissions and in berkeley there's 36 citizens commissions uh speaking about everything from marina development to uh, uh foreign policy in middle in the middle east came out and spoke that we don't charge other transit agencies to stop and pick up passengers um, along our city streets so we are able to to get that property at no cost which you would think would be a success Unfortunately, it brought its own problems. Since we're not getting money, uh, since we're not paying the city money, there's still a deep sentiment of opposition to seeing this ferry terminal go forward because they don't see what's the benefit to the city. So probably not unlike what's happening here, NIMBYism still lives, thrives in the San Francisco Bay Area. We've been at the, at the Berkeley Ferry Terminal project in the environmental phase for over three years. Matter of fact, we've been at it for so long our federal funding partner is questioning whether we don't have to start all over again because it's been so long. Um, and we, we see no end in sight to solving these issues, unfortunately. This is not peaches and cream speech today. And this is, this is some of the realities that we're really, really facing. Um, at every turn, we, we find new groups opposing our efforts. Um, environmentalists in the Bay Area, curiously, have, have opposed ferry service, originally because of smog. So we, we agreed to uh, adopt standards for our boats that reduce nitrates of oxide levels and so forth. Great idea, except for now we have 1,000 plus pound catalytic converters on our boats, so our boats are incredibly greenhouse inefficient. So you push the mole down in one area and it comes up in another and gets whacked. It's my nickname, whack-a-mole. Um, in terms of what the Bay Area does in ferry services, just a quick context. We are the one of two public operators. Golden Gate Bridge Highway Transit District was spared the anguish of being uh, transitioned to WETA. By the way, we've been negotiating for three years with the cities, one of which is bankrupt, to take over their ferry service, and they don't want to give it up. We're close to the end on that. You think about an on unwelcome takeover, you can't imagine what that was like. Uh, but between, uh, between the Golden Gate services and the two that we'll be operating, we carry approximately 5,000 passengers a day. The vast majority are commuters. In the summertime, we get a healthy amount of recreation travel. Of course, San Francisco, like New York, is a huge tourist destination. People will, will take a public ferry at 7 or $8 a fare. 
rather than pay $30 to, to go on an excursion ferry. The emergency response role that, that we have been charged with is several fold. One is on a capital and development side and the other is on an operational side. Theoretically, in the event of a major disaster, regional disaster, we have, in essence, police powers to marshal all the ferry services under our control, even Golden Gates, even though they, they remain a separate agency, and to run those services as we see fit with assistance from local municipalities. A lot of the vision of the WETA was to build a system, as Ian spoke to, as a backbone in the event of an emergency. The real challenge for us has been, how do you do that? You can't build boats and have them sit. By definition, a, the minute you build a boat and it sits in water, it starts needing maintenance. That's an operating cost. It's an unfunded mandate. And plus, it looks really stupid to have a bunch of boats sitting around not doing anything. We have four boats in our system. Um, right now, uh, we don't technically have any ferry services up and running, so we're doing a, uh, a thing of moving our boats around, using them for other services as backup. It's quite a challenge to keep those boats in operation. In terms of new ferry terminals, when I first uh, was introduced to the uh, uh, Waterfront Alliance, I came and spoke to the staff and we talked about what it costs to build a ferry terminal in the Bay Area. We estimate. 25 to 40 million dollars per ferry terminal to build a new terminal to meet all the requirements um, the dredging requirements the environmental requirements just the public process to build a ferry terminal um, unlike new york from what i can see we comply with all the requirements of the americans with disabilities act very big issue here uh, and for us um, Golden Gate is under a consent decree now from the disabled community, is going to have to spend millions of dollars to retrofit their ferry terminals. And the trick with ferry terminals in the ADA is, uh, you know, I, I wasn't trying to be facetious. It's trying to design a system that works with boats with different free boards in different tidal conditions and meets the 1 in 12 ramping requirements. We spent over two years engineering a design to make that work, which leads to a lot of the costs of our, of our floats. We have over a million dollars worth of ramping on our floats. Now, we did that in part so that any one of our floats could be used by any one of the public transit ferry boats in this region, so we have interchangeability. Having a strong background in transit operations, I don't want to create a system that we constrain operations through through bad capital planning decisions early on. So those are some of the, the major highlights, the low lives of trying to operate or, or build a ferry system in the Bay Area. From the original in, uh, implementation and operations plan, we are charged with building up to eight new ferry terminals in San Francisco Bay. I can say confidently all eight are under study, four of which are known as the Four Sisters, three of which will probably never see the light of day because they have not a penny of operating money or capital money, one of which is being, another one of which is being built, and two or three are in development. Our real challenge will be, since we're taking over these existing operations and building, theoretically, the Berkeley service, we will be out of operating funds to expand service. There's talk about a new uh, bridge toll increase, another dollar, but we get pennies on the dollar. There's so much fierce competition for those dollars. We don't have the friends we used to have in the state legislature. Um, they've since been termed out of office. And without a strong political will in Sacramento and regionally, we're going to be hard pressed to come up with new operating funds. So now that I've bummed you all out, I'll sit down. <laughs> Great. Thanks, John, and thanks, Ian. That was really very interesting. And now I'm going to ask uh, Genevieve Clifton to uh, be the first one to respond. Thanks, Pierre. I'm fairly sure I wasn't supposed to go next, but since we were bummed out, Pierre thought he would bring up the state of New Jersey. <laughs> so in my office, we manage the federal funding that comes uh, in, in terms of ferry boat discretionary fund through the federal government to our office. That funding is the only funding we have outside of uh, some small amounts of planning dollars to be able to do any capital construction or to funnel through to any capital 
construction in New Jersey. That, that money can go towards capital planning as well as some vessel design and vessel acquisition, but we're very limited in what we're able to use those funds for, um, though, though I'm thankful we do have them. My office, um, we, while we manage the funding, we pretty much only play a cooperative role in the harbor in terms of safe navigation and operations. We're not regulatory and we're not operational. Really, we simply advise and, and work with our local partners and agencies as well as our friends at the U.S. Coast Guard to inform decision making. And with that small pot of uh, planning dollars I mentioned earlier, we have Pierre and uh, HDR undertaking a ferry planning analysis and strategic plan to identify what our vision is and what it should be in relationship to all the other ferry planning and strategic mobility work that has been done in the region. What, one of the things that's uh, really important to me is that we don't want to have dueling visions. We want to make sure that we're fitting together uh, like a nice nice puzzle. We don't, we don't want to be duking it out over our, our vision for the harbor. So, so some thoughts about our system. It can be an ad hoc and confusing system. I liken it a little bit to eating spaghetti with a spoon, right? We're not hungry, but we're not necessarily fulfilled either. It can be a little <laughs> sloppy at times. Um, and, and we have competing interests. New York State's interests aren't necessarily New Jersey's interests, aren't necessarily the Port Authority's interest. Yet cooperation is, is the hallmark, I think, of what we do in the harbor. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be the vice chair on the Harbor Operations Committee for many years, and uh, we develop non-regulatory solutions to operational challenges that we have in the harbor, of which ferry management is one. Uh, we do that in that committee through the passenger vessel subcommittee, and we basically self-direct to the extent we can our management in partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard. And that's what makes that group really strong, is that the Coast Guard uh, supports us 100 percent, and, and we work in lockstep with them to make sure we're getting it right. And uh, the, the one thing I can certainly say in our region is um, while we have independent operators, they have answered the call to duty faithfully time and again in our harbor. So we really can't um, overlook that uh, as, as public agencies when, when we work with them. Um, but what I can say is that, uh, Chris Ford said it earlier, that the system's fragile. I would take that a step further and say, I think overall, our overall transportation system is, is fragile. The redundancy and security that we need to keep our transportation system vibrant in the harbor is, is something that can't be understated. And I don't think we want to take advantage of or, or become complacent about the fact that our once water transportation system exists or how it exists in context to overall mobility and connectivity. So thinking about WIDA, which is what Pierre asked me to do, um, like, like here, there were some, um, there was a case that it was driven to some extent by necessity. And, and I, it's obvious here, right, that we need to be prepared and redundant when it comes to our transportation system, both from an emergency management standpoint as well as an economic and recovery standpoint. And as public sector leaders, we wouldn't be doing our jobs well if we didn't take advantage of all the resources we have and opportunities we have, of which our marine transportation system is one. You know, I happen to be a water girl, but all the uh, public leaders that were here earlier all, all get it. Um, they're all talking about what value our, our harbor brings, and I think the transportation system, uh, not just necessarily the port commerce, but the ferry transportation system, being able to move people around is, is one of our great opportunities. So what do I see as challenges to a WIDA model in our area? The WIDA folks have clearly identified their challenges for us, uh, but I would say that uh, while they took on a role of emergency management, most of us in government here would say that there's more than enough people doing emergency management. Um, the upside to a WIDA type structure might be that um, perhaps there could be a more coordinated approach uh, to what we do, and that, that might have some value for all of us to consider. Um, but I, I don't know that in our area we would be able to um, fold that function in without talking about it for a really, really, really long long time. So I've asked myself more than once, right, why the public sector should do what the private sector is already doing really well. 
And I, I tend to not think that we should be involved in the ferry business. That's just my two cents. I, I think the ferry operators know what they're doing, and I really don't want to be the person telling them how they should do it. Uh, but overall, I do think that we can have certainly a greater level of interstate coordination uh, in terms of being able to acquire system resources and maximize the available resources, including money that flows through New Jersey. I can tell you I don't think we do that as well as we could be doing it. Uh, transit connectivity and VFT, VMT reduction, taking um, vehicle miles traveled down. There is a competitive issue, certainly, for other transit systems, but there's, there's some room for us to grow there. A service to underserved communities and affordability is important, um, certainly on the New Jersey side as, as well as on the New York side, I'm sure. And I, I think there's a lot of shared opportunities that we're probably missing because maybe we don't work as well together as we could or to some extent that I think there's just not enough of us focused on ferries and ferry system planning in the harbor. Could there be more efficiencies and economies of scale gained under sort of a regional umbre umbrella? I, I think that's a great question for us to ask and, and consider here today. I think that's why Roland likes to bring people together to answer the tough questions. Um, but, I, but I really do think that um, jointly we can put a greater emphasis on the need for and the value of our regional marine transportation system. I'm thinking public leaders, public sector leaders, um, can place an even higher value on ferry service, higher value on interstate cooperation. On my side, you know, I would wonder that perhaps one more staff person um, might outweigh the need for 24 million to be involved in, in an overall umbrella operation. I, you know, I don't know what the answer is to that, whether it's staff resources or whether it's a more coordinated, higher level approach. I, I can't answer that question and maybe um, some folks at the table will have some more ideas on that. But um, much like we do now, I, I think that if we work together a little bit better and we can find a way to do that better, I think that's the thing that's going to take us forward in our region. Thanks, Peter. Thanks a lot, Genevieve. And uh, now, Janet Cox. Good afternoon. It's, it's always a pleasure for me to look around the room because I know so many of you in the ferry business. I, John, I know from our work on TRB in, on the national level. I want to thank you all for being here. I always appreciate that Roland has asked me to come and speak at, at a conference. Um, and sometimes I feel like I'm almost saying the same thing over and over again. And, and I'm preaching to the choir. It's also hard to follow my executive director who speaks about governance and about how things seem to come together naturally without pushing the button. We don't always have to plan how we come together. I look at my public sector partners and I know that we work together informally and it doesn't always have to be as formal as we'd like. I also look at, I know that we're in different places in terms of the systems that we manage. The Port Authority basically got into the ferry business in 1989 because we were concerned about capacity on path. It is no different in 2011. We are concerned about capacity on path and our Trans-Hudson Network of Bridges, Tunnels, and Terminals. If the 23,000 people who, t who are basically on the Hoboken and Jersey City routes, if they transferred to PATH, I'd have a problem. Chris Ward would have a problem. If in an emergency situation we couldn't call on the ferry operators to support us if PATH goes out, or if there's a problem on a tunnel for our commuters to, to look to the ferry operators, then we'd have a problem. But when I look to see what the city is doing in the development of their waterfront in Brooklyn and Queens, as well as moving people to lower and midtown Manhattan, I realize that that has already happened on the Trans-Hudson Network. So that we're in a different place and that the city will move to the place that maybe the Port Authority is, is looking at at some other point. When John and Ian talked about the, the slow growth of their system, I realize how fast, in many cases, that 20 years from 1989 to now, it's a little bit more than 20, let me count. Okay, 20 years that it may take them to get to where the Trans-Hudson Network has matured. I looked at the city and I say to be, it's a long way to go in terms of where we're going in, in ferry transportation. 
I also look at, at when I started with the Port Authority and Ferry Transportation, I had a budget of about $136 million. It's gone. So when people say, what are we going to do the next time, I realize that those resources are scarce and the Port Authority may be focused on downtown, they may be focused on the Bayonne Bridge, and there's not any additional money to put in infrastructure. The infrastructure is there. My job is to make sure that that infrastructure is used to its capacity. That, that if in a no, may possibly no arc environment, that ferry service is used to move people for on that trans Hudson network. So I'm not gonna say where do we go in terms of governance. I don't believe that, that's a, that question has been going around for a long time. Do we need one entity to be responsible for ferry transportation in the harbor? If you ask my opinion, I say no, because we're in different places. What we need to do is have healthy ferry operators in the harbor who can answer the call in an emergency. And what we need to do is, as public partners is to work closely together, as Genevieve has mentioned, so that we are applying for for federal funds to ensure that if there's an emergency, no matter where it is in the harbor, that we can reimburse the operators who come and respond. So the question again is whether or not uh, an umbrella, I say no, but I say cooperation between the operators and between the public entities so that we can move forward to the next step. Thanks, Janet. Uh, and now, uh, Bill Wheeler from MTA is going to come up. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think what I'd like to do is, um, instead of sort of talking about what MTA does, we do some modest things with ferries. We feed some of our commuter rail lines. but. I'd like to get you to think about, well, what are the ingredients that would make ferries play a larger role in transportation in this region? In the California instance, we heard, there were, we heard the words earthquake, legislature, cross-subsidy. Those are some factors that could play a role in greater ferry operations in the region. Um, let's take earthquakes, for example. Some, what, what kind of a situation or a spark would be needed to generate more of a demand for ferries and show that ferries can play a role other than, other than say, just a, uh, a limited one as, as of today. And I, I've got an idea and I'll come back to that in a minute. Legislature, that's the second one. The MTA, like a lot of the other um, transportation agencies in the state, are funded by the legislature. And I think that in any situation, if there were to be a funding resource, a new one, and I can't imagine it given these times, but I think the legislature would certainly have to be involved in it because it's certainly a regional resource. And whether the two states can agree on something or not, that might even be more difficult, but right now there really isn't a devoted source of funds, and uh, so therefore the private sector, to its credit, steps in and uh, develops service and operates it, uh, but in many ways, Except for the, the load shedder to path that Janet was talking about earlier, uh, the, the ferry services, while strong, are still sort of niche services. They operate to meet certain uh, market demands that are, uh, say, geographically snug. And the question would be, uh, could they be broader than that? But that would take certainly some sort of a, a funding resource, a cross-subsidy possibly, uh, but, but, but something to overcome that limitation. You might also ask, well, if, uh, what could the private sector, what could the public sector do to support ferry service more significantly uh, if it couldn't provide operating subsidy? Well, maybe capital resources are, uh, are, are an answer, and the Port Authority does that quite effectively. Uh, but there has to be some, some spark, I would argue, some, some event some, something that would trigger uh, a wider recognition for the effectiveness of ferries in New York. It's not enough to say that the water is here and, oh, what a wonderful resource it would be if we could use it more, because there's other resources like that. There are people that look at abandoned rail lines and they go, oh, if we only had a train here, wouldn't things be great? But that's not the point. The point is you've got to solve a problem with ferry transport. You have to solve a problem. And going back to what Janet, Janet said earlier, with PATH having a lot of difficulties 
and the Trans-Hudson crossings have a lot of difficulties, uh, ferry can be a very effective load shedder. So that's an example of a practical problem. So here's an idea, and it's not an MTA idea. It's a Bill Wheeler idea. It's something that I started thinking about when I was working downtown right after 9-11 with my Port Authority colleagues to try to figure out what would be a way to bring transportation back even more effectively to the downtown area. I happen to be speaking with somebody from the National Park Service. We were talking about the memorial, we were talking about the World Trade Center site, and that individual said to me, and this was going back several years, that probably once the memorial is established and the site itself is, um, is more stabilized, it could be the number one, certainly the number two, but possibly the number one attraction in the United States for any memorial, any memorial, whether that be the World War II Memorial, Vietnam, anything, that this could be the number one attraction in the U.S. And if that were the case, and we expect that it will draw millions of people a year, what's the Hudson access to it uh, via rail and mostly bus is going to be a big issue. And my colleagues at the port are wrestling and the city are rec wrestling with um, uh, the, the volumes of bus services that are planned and access and so forth. And I haven't kept in touch with the thinking about this. I've, I've moved on to some other regional projects. But, but at one point I was thinking, well, if those customers were intercepted west of Hudson by ferry to access a network of attractions, including the World Trade Center site, Ellis Island, and so forth. Wouldn't that be the kind of event or the kind of, not niche, but really major load shedder opportunity that ferries might play? Just my idea, uh, you'd have to, they'd have to be intercepted west of Hudson somewhere, but think about all the millions of people that are come, they're going to come from, the, and they surely will, from continental U.S. to this area to see the memorial and experience it, uh, and would that be an opportunity? So that's something to think about, but what I would leave you with is that to be successful in this region, it's not enough to say that the water is here, let's take advantage of the water as, as, as a, a resource. There's got to be a problem to be solved and an opportunity use opportunity and a funding opportunity, but first use that would spark a greater role for ferries in the region. So I'd like you to think about that because I think that's the challenge that we're facing today. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you and I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thanks, uh, Madeline Wills from New York City Economic Development Corporation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to uh, uh, sum some of this up and uh, also say that um, New York City EDC, along with the City Council and the uh, City of New York is, as you probably all know, is going to pilot an interborough ferry service starting this June. It will be the most comprehensive service that the city has ever tried. Uh, the city and actually some of the uh, carriers, private carriers, have tried uh, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, a ferry here, a ferry there, uh, with very long headways and service that uh, hasn't been all that consistent. And uh, so we're going to actually uh, subsidize the service, give it a shot, the best shot that we have, in actually seeing whether or not um, what we think uh, can actually be attainable. And, and uh, EDC did a comprehensive ferry study, which we completed uh, recently. And one of the things that we discovered, which is, one, New York City has more ferry service than any other city in the United States largely because of the Staten Island Ferry, which carries 20 million people a year. Uh, 10 million uh, on, as Janet said, on the um, Jersey, uh, uh, New York, uh, Hudson River lines. Uh, so it's actually 30 million people already come to New York City via Staten Island or New Jersey or Yonkers by, by ferry system. Um, 
so we carry a lot of people, and yet we don't have a comprehensive plan. We don't really have a, a way to really make this into a, a sustainable service. But what we're trying to do here is the city has come up with approximately $9 million to subsidize the service for three years, which will make seven stops along the um, Brooklyn-Queens border c coming into Manhattan. So we will be leaving from Hunters Point South, going down to North Williamsburg, South Williamsburg, Greenpoint, making our way to Fulton Ferry Landing, and then coming to P11 and then 34th Street. Uh, at 34th Street, we will, uh, due to the uh, graciousness of uh, New York Waterways, who is our um, provider, going to be uh, running a bus that will take you then into Midtown, straight from uh, 34th Street. So every 20 minutes, there'll be a bus. What we discovered uh, when we thought about this ferry service is that headways really count. So we wanted to make sure that we provided 20 minute maximum headways, because what we determined is that as long as people know that if you miss a ferry, and there's one right behind you, and you don't have to wait for a very long time, that people will wait to take the next ferry. One of the other uh, pieces of information that we realized from the study was that ferry service, at least from an interborough point of view, will never uh, really work like mass transit. I think when the council asked us to do this study, they thought, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have service from Brooklyn, from Astoria, from uh, the Bronx, from Staten Island. And what we realized is that ferry service is very expensive. And whereas the capital investment isn't as large as a subway, the operational um, investment is, is very great, as you've heard from our counterparts at the Port Authority and, and San Francisco. We'd, uh, so what we believe is we can make some sense out of ferry service if we think about providing it in areas where there really is no good alternatives. And that really brings us to the new development that the city and our private partners are doing on the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront. With these new large scale developments on the waterfronts where there is very little good access to subways, particularly the L line, which is very, very overcrowded, that this is really where we want to concentrate uh, our ferry, ferry service. Now, some people may say, well, what you're doing is providing ferry service to the areas that where only the wealthy can live. It's not entirely true because there are a lot of people living within those areas, but the fact is, is that you really need to equate ferry service with express bus service. That's really the closest in subsidy in, in uh, the closest in what we can charge is fair to make a, ser a ferry service um, sustainable. So you really look at it, well, we really look at it as the equivalent of express bus service, which is, you know, available to people who can afford a little extra uh, on the way to make their, their um, commutes a little bit more comfortable. Uh, so. We will be starting this in June. Uh, the date will be announced next week. Uh, the fare levels will also be announced next week. And uh, we're going to, uh, with our help from New York Waterways, uh, give it the city's best shot in finding out whether there's a way to make this work. But I will say, the big question, and certainly, uh, even though it was a little bit depressing, John, I think <laughs> it almost made me feel a little bit better because I was wondering what your magic bullet was here. Uh, we have not been able to figure out a way to make service sustainable. So even if we can make this Brooklyn Queen service, the East River service work, there's a Hudson River service that can come down from the Bronx down to Pier 11. There's a South Brooklyn service that can go up the East River. There's um, another service down the East River that we think could work. But if we have to actually provide four services, the city, the city cannot do this. 
And they can't do this because, um, one, cities uh, without help from our transportation partners is not really in the business of providing transportation subsidies and not to the level of this. Two, uh, we have a Port Authority uh, that answers to not only the state of New York, but the state of New Jersey, and they have their priorities, as Janet was saying. The MTA is a state agency, and they have a lot of their priorities. And yes, we could work a lot better, we could be a lot more aligned, but everybody has the funding priorities. And maybe it's time for us to all start to rethink about what all these transportation authorities actually do. This is a separate actual, and this is again, Bill Wheeler had his thought, Madeline Wills has her own thought, but we have these transportation authorities that are over 100 years old. Maybe it's time to start to rethink about how all these transportation authorities work, you know, what the bridges and tunnels uh, fund, and, um, and just take a, a, a new look at this. But, um, and I'm not saying this just in the way to, to fund ferries, but we have funding issues at our airports. We have funding issues all over the place. And we're, we're already charging $8 for, uh, to take a bridge. Um, so some people already cannot afford those types of, um, um, you know, funding issues, funding needs. So um, I also want to tell you, John, that we're spending a million and a half dollars to make our, our, our ferry landings ADA compliant. So uh, uh, this will be ready in June uh, for the ferry landings that we are now providing. We're building actually a, a couple of new barges. They're floating down the rivers as we speak, and uh, we should have them in place in the ne next couple of weeks, and they will all be ADA compliant. Uh, I felt I needed to put that plug in in case anybody was uh, uh, going to talk to me after about this. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, say that where I think we can uh, use WIDA as an example, uh, everyone said it already, we need to be able to coordinate our ferry services better. And I think with the MTA, where the opportunity is, is to, is to rationalize the bus subway services better with the ferry services in Brooklyn and Queens so that eventually you can transfer from a bus and, or a subway that may be crowded and get onto the ferry service and um, so this is something we've been in conversations with the MTA about. We'd like to work a little harder on this to get this done sooner rather than later. And um, with all of your help, um, hopefully we can get that done. And uh, I invite you all to take this ferry service. I also want to say we're going to have a recreational service on the weekends because we have such wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunities for recreation. New York Waterways will be running a service on Fridays uh, from Brooklyn to Governor's Island. And on Saturday, Sundays, we're going to be doing a loop from what will be the newly opened East River Esplanade on the uh, Manhattan side to uh, uh, Fulton Ferry Landing, where you can access the Brooklyn Bridge Park, and to Governor's Island. So there'll be a loop running. And uh, for a modest fee, you can enjoy all the wonderful sights of uh, of the harbor. Thank you. Uh, from here for the rest of this panel is uh, we've got a series of questions. Some of them are directed towards some specific people on the panel. 